You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art Ed? I'm trying to spice it. Who art Ed? Mr. Wood, <laughs> art Ed, me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it's a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're going to be looking at Hokusai. Now, before I get started, a quick reminder, if you're listening on Amazon Music or another platform supporting episode-specific cover art, you can see an image of the work from this week's episode and every episode. Also, welcome to the new listeners who've discovered the show recently. Uh, Jennifer Dazzle, the host of Art Curious, was nice enough to put an episode of Who Arted in her feed to introduce her audience. And I got to say, it was a surreal moment for me as I've been an Art Curious listener myself pretty much since the show began. And I want to encourage my listeners, if somehow you're listening to this show and you're not also subscribed to Art Curious... She is always putting out good content, doing a deeper dive than I do, but I have discovered so many wonderful things from listening to Art Curious. Highly recommend it. Now on to the actual topic for today, Katsushika Hokusai. Hokusai was born October or November 1760 in the Katsushika district of Edo. Edo today is known as Tokyo. His name at birth was not Katsushika Hokusai. His childhood name was Takitaro. In Japan at that time, it was fairly common for artists to adopt different names throughout their careers. He started writing and painting at the age of six. By the time he was a teenager, he was showing quite a bit of promise as an artist. At 14, he apprenticed as a woodcarver for woodblock prints. Now, woodblock printing was basically using a block of wood as a stamp. An artist would draw an image on paper, then the drawing would be placed face down onto a block of wood. Essentially, they would do a transfer technique, think gluing the drawing onto the block, and the original drawing would then be destroyed as the paper was wet and peeled away, but the ink would be on the block. From there, a wood carver would get to work carving away to leave the design in raised relief. Ink would be run over the top of the block, then a paper pressed down onto the surface. They didn't use a printing press. People would rub on the back of the paper to make sure every inch of the surface was pressed to the block. For a black and white image, a single block would be used, but for multicolored prints, skilled artisans would have to carve a separate block for each color. They would use registration marks to carefully align the paper for multiple printings. It's difficult work requiring great skill, but also patience and attention to detail. Hokusai spent four years learning the printmaking process as a carver before he joined the studio of Katsukawa Shunsho. While he's best remembered for his landscapes, Hokusai tackled all sorts of subjects. During the Yukioe period, prints were not really high art. It was a commercial gig making posters for the new middle class. In the early days, in 1779, Hokusai was going by the name Shunro, as he made his first prints of kabuki actors. It was fairly common for up-and-coming artists to adopt a name based off the name of the artist who was training them. Just as an aside, Hokusai's daughter would grow up to become an artist herself, going by the name Katsushika Oi. Unsurprisingly, she learned quite a bit from her father and likely worked in his studio. I think one of the most delightful facts I learned from listening to Art Curious, I was not aware of Katsushika Oi before listening to Art Curious, but if you want to learn more, I'll link the episode in the show notes. Anyways, Oi is a Japanese word said to get someone's attention. Oi basically is like calling, hey you, and Hokusai would playfully call out to his daughter saying Oi, and she adopted that as her name. So in this time, like the 1780s or so, Hokusai was focused a lot on celebrities from the kabuki theater. Although he also painted other things, he made waterfalls, dragons, you name it. Over his career, Hokusai made 
paintings and prints, but he also made books, manga, trading cards, puzzles. Some of his prints even seem to have been used in packaging for snacks, but that would come later. In 1793, Shunsho died, and another artist took over the school. Hokusai began studying some Western art when he could get his hands on French and Dutch copper engravings. While Japan was a secluded nation, closed off from the rest of the world at that time, they still had some trade with the Dutch and the Chinese. It's not exactly clear why, some say because of studies at a rival school, but Hokusai was kicked out of the Katsukawa school. He would later say, What really motivated the development of my artistic style was the embarrassment I suffered at Shunko's hands. Shunko being the protege of Shunsho, uh, the artist that Hokusai initially studied under. But it was at this point, after being kicked out of the Katsukawa school, that Hokusai started to move away from figurative work like actors and more towards landscapes. His most famous landscape is, of course, the Great Wave off Kanagawa. Many see this as a quintessential Japanese piece. At first glance, it's almost serene as the mountain stands in the background. The silhouette of the sky and water almost make like a yin-yang sort of a symbol. The mountain, of course, is Mount Fuji. It was part of a series of 36 views of Mount Fuji. In the foreground, though, we see massive waves. The waves are towering over some poor fishermen in their boats. The perspective with Mount Fuji tiny in the distance makes the waves in the foreground appear to tower over the mountain itself. There's a sort of tension there that many see as metaphorical for what's happening in Japan in the 19th century as this artwork was created. Japan had been closed off for 200 years. It was largely happy and prosperous in its seclusion, but the outside world was coming with tremendous force and energy that could be exciting, but also threatening. The piece shows quite the dichotomy, not only in the tranquil mountains standing amid the turbulent waves, but also it's a traditional Japanese woodcut printed with Prussian blue, an import often referred to as Berlin blue at the time. A blue had long been a notoriously difficult and expensive pigment to get. Prussian blue was a synthetic pigment developed in a lab and mass-produced. When it came to Japan, likely through their limited trade with China, people loved it. It was not only a beautiful blue, but it also held up well over time. It was less likely to fade. Many artists, including Hokusai, created monochromatic prints in shades of blue to capitalize on the popularity of the imported color. Ultimately, I think it's the tension that makes this piece so amazing. Hokusai doesn't give us the wave crashing onto the boats. He doesn't show us the final impact. He shows us the wave towering over them. It's the potential energy. We all know those fishermen are in a precarious situation, but the great wave gives us the dramatic moment when the wave is at its peak. It's this unstoppable, frenzied force of nature juxtaposed with the mountain and the clouds in the sky that seem peaceful and serene, steady off in the distance, no matter what's happening in the world around it. Amazingly, Despite the tension, the peril, and the promise, the ambivalence and seeming opposite emotions conveyed in this work are in perfect balance. I guess it really is the quintessential Japanese piece. Now, if you want to learn more, check the show notes. I'll link a couple related episodes, including the Art Curious episode on Katsushika Oi one of the coolest artists you've probably never heard of. 
This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.